Hi, everybody. Great to see so many familiar faces here. Also great to be at Book People because everyone understands bookstores are closing everywhere and Book People has been one of the anchors of this community in the 21 years I've been here and I've always appreciated it. So thanks so much. Uh, yes, a round of applause for Book People. Uh, I thought I'd start by talking about the title, Arguing for Our Lives, and then that dynamic subtitle, A User's Guide to Constructive Dialogue. I'd like to make it clear this was not my preferred title. <laughs> As you can imagine, this is a title created by a sales force. So let me explain how the title uh, came to be. My original title was Anxiety and Anguish. Critical thinking in crisis times. Now, I really liked that title. I thought that was a real zinger. And the first part of it, anxiety and anguish, didn't get past my editor, who said, I think for, for marketing purposes, maybe a book called Anxiety and Anguish may not be you know, where we want to start. And I said, OK, and we came up with Arguing for Our Lives, which at least conveyed some of the ur sense of urgency. And then critical thinking in crisis times didn't make it past the sales force, which said, we will not sell any copies of a book with the words critical thinking in it. <laughs> so, so welcome to America. So I thought I would explain the book by explaining that original title. Uh, anxiety and anguish, critical thinking in crisis times. So first of all, what do I mean by crisis times? Uh, I mean that if we look honestly at the state of the world in which we live, every major system that structures that world is in decline and or collapse. That means both human systems and natural systems. The economic system in which we live Global corporate capitalism is in collapse, not from my point of view just a cyclical downturn, but a long-term structural crisis. The political system doesn't meet even the minimal conceptions of democracy. We'll get back to that in a minute. The social system, the culture, seems increasingly corrosive. Basically, if you look around, things are not going so well within the human family. That's the good news because the state of the larger living world is even more dramatically in decline. Uh, I don't care what indicator of the health of the ecosystems that make our own life possible. I don't care what indicator you look at. The news is bad on all fronts and the news is getting worse. The most obvious crisis is with global warming and we'll talk more about that in a minute as well. But whether you're looking at groundwater contamination, topsoil loss, biodiversity, extinction of species, the growing toxicity of all systems, including in the human body, the number and growing size of the dead zones in the world's ocean. Pick any indicator of the underlying health of the ecosphere that makes our own life possible. The news is bad and getting dramatically worse. That's what I mean by crisis times. Uh, that may seem like uh, depressing, like a downer. I'm often asked if I model my life on Eeyore, um, but I'm just trying to rationally assess what the state of the world looks like. So if that's in fact uh, an honest account of where we're at, what's an appropriate response to this? Well, that's where the anxiety comes in. If people are aware that in fact these systems are in decline, then a certain amount of anxiety is hardly surprising. And I think apart from the anxiety that comes from specific stresses we all feel in our lives at various points, I think a lot of anxiety in the culture today is somehow connected to that. I certainly have felt it myself and run into people all the time who feel it. So the book begins with recognizing that we live in a, what I call an age, <coughs> excuse me, an age of anxiety. And then I suggest that there's a way to cope with that and that is to embrace anguish. A slightly counterintuitive move, perhaps, right? that you deal with your anxiety by embracing the anguish. But that, that term, uh, I struggled to find the right word to describe my own experience of being in the world. 
Uh, just talking about being depressed didn't seem to cut it. That's too personalized, and in a way, I don't really feel depressed. But a sense of anguish, a, a deep grief, strikes me as an appropriate way to react to the world. So what I'm suggesting in the book in the introduction and then in the conclusion is that if you feel that anxiety at some level, the best move is to embrace the anguish and recognize, in fact, we do live in an age of anguish, which is not an invitation to paralysis. It's an invitation to action from my point of view. So anxiety and anguish, critical thinking in crisis times. Um, what do I mean by critical thinking? Well, here I'm going to draw on the experience I've had in the classroom at the University of Texas, but also on the experience that I've had in the community doing various kinds of political organizing and public speaking, and recognizing that, in fact, there is a distinct lack of critical thinking going on in the culture. And this is not going to lead to a sometimes predictable talk about uh, the dumbing down of America, or how these kids, the problem is the kids these days just aren't doing the critical thinking, you know? That's the problem. That's it. If the problem is the kids these days, you know what I'm saying? That's a good, that's a good line for this audience where the average age is, well, not in kid range anymore. So it's very easy for those of us who are older to talk about the problem, the problem with the kids. You say, okay, the problem is not the kids. The problem is the culture. And I think we have, beyond critical thinking as it's typically used perhaps in a public school setting to teach certain kinds of formal and informal logic and things like that, to talk more holistically about what kind of critical thinking we need to do. And it's not just a problem of young people, it's a problem of the culture. And so in the book I go through uh, some preliminary suggestions and about, about how to approach this and then try to do some critical thinking on specific issues. And that's what I want to do here in short order because I want to leave a lot of time for conversation. I thought I'd talk about this in some sense by dealing with the problem we have with science in this culture. Uh, I'm, in the book, I basically argue that we have to hold two ideas in our heads at the same time. One is that science is crucial to contemporary society, and the denial of the power of science is ridiculous. We all know there are pockets of society that in fact do deny the power of science, but one can't live in the modern world without recognizing the way that the Enlightenment, the scientific method, the scientific revolution has dramatically expanded what we know about the world, and in fact, all of modern life is based on that science for the most part. We wouldn't be sitting here with electric lights and microphones without it. So there's no sense in denying the centrality of science to our worlds. At the same time, we have to better recognize the limits of science, because more dangerous than denying science is glorifying science. So I thought I'd talk about this in the context of the most controversial findings of science these days, which of course is climate change, global warming, the idea that the earth is heating up and human beings have something to do with it. Uh, I'm going to suggest there's really two kinds of climate change denial going on in the culture today. One is the, the form we're most uh, aware of, that is people who either deny the earth is warming at all or deny that human beings have any significant role in that. That's what we call climate change denial. And there's some interesting research on where that climate change denial tends to be strongest. It tends to be strongest in the Republican Party, not the Democratic Party. Uh, and it tends to be strongest with people who are susceptible to conspiracy theories. There's a lot of interesting research on where the, the strongest pockets of climate change denial are. That's the climate change denial that says we don't believe the science. Now, most of those people don't reject modern science across the board. Right? They don't refuse to believe that the computer works, for instance, or that electric lights work. And so it's a very selective denial of science. And we can see the problem there and refute it quite clearly. We've all probably had discussions where we point out that 97% of competent client sci climate scientists agree that, if anything, the projections of the climate scientists have been 
overly conservative, that the globe is heating faster, and the positive feedback loops suggest we're in deeper trouble than we ever imagined. So that's the first kind of climate change denial. The second kind of climate change denial comes from people who accept the science but refuse to act on the reality of that science. The Republican Party is where you'll find climate change denial of the first kind. The Democratic Party is where you'll find climate change denial of the second kind. The idea that science, yes, science tells us things, but somehow there is going to be some magic moment when we are going to transcend that reality. And that climate change denial is every bit as dangerous as the first type. Now, the first kind of climate change denial, if you assert that in fact it is uh, denial, people will come up with all sorts of reasons, including often theological reasons. There's a kind of religious fundamentalism often behind that climate change denial or a kind of economic fundamentalism behind that denial. It's, most of the climate change denial is rooted either in religion or a fanatical embrace of capitalism or both. I've never really understood how those two go together, but that's for another talk, perhaps. Right. That's the kind of fundamentalism, this religious and economic fundamentalism that fuels the first kind of climate change denial. The second kind is usually fueled by a technological fundamentalism, a belief that whatever problems we face, including the problems that were created by the use of high energy, high technology, will be solved by more high energy, high technology. It's a nice little fundamentalist wrap. Right. Whatever problems we have that come from burning all this fossil fuel and the innovations that were made possible by all that surplus energy, that caused some problems, we acknowledge. And we're going to solve those problems by essentially doubling down on high energy, high technology. And that is every bit as fundamentalist as the religious or economic fundamentalism. Both of those are a form of climate change denial. And we have to start thinking, I would argue, a whole lot more in a whole lot more complex ways about how we cannot abandon science or abandon the pursuit of new technologies that might, for instance, lower the amount of carbon we're throwing in the air. But we also can't believe that that is going to save us. And so I think critical thinking about science is a balancing of the recognition of the value of science in understanding the physical world and recognizing the limitations that science has in helping us cope with that world. It's a plea for what one of my favorite authors, Wes Jackson, calls an ignorance-based worldview. So this book on critical thinking makes a plea for an ignorance-based worldview. What does that mean? Well, as Wes Jackson develops it, it doesn't mean a, a celebration of being stupid. Uh, it means a recognition that however sophisticated our science is, however we can peel back the mysteries of nature, that our ignorance always far outstrips our knowledge. In the way Wes puts it, our knowledge is not adequate to run the world. And that in fact, many of the problems we face today are a direct result of human beings believing that our knowledge is adequate to run the world. Our knowledge is adequate to screw up the world, and we do that quite well. But Wes and others in this movement for a sustainable agriculture and a sustainable world more generally might argue that our knowledge is not adequate to the run the world. In other words, we aren't capable of playing God. And here I'm not going to launch into a theological treatise, but I think it's useful to remember that for all of the fundamentalism in religion, religion also carries with it a lot of wisdom. And one of those pieces of wisdom from the religious traditions is a recognition that we are not God. Whatever you think the term means and whether the term means anything to you or not, we are not it. Whatever God is, we are not it. And in fact, a lot of the, I think, most important stories from those religious traditions are a call to humility a recognition, in fact, that we cannot intervene in the world and pretend to have the knowledge to run the world. So that's part of this book, is a plea, in a sense, for a, a more sensible approach to what human beings can know. 
The second part of the book looks at critical thinking in practice, right? looking at, in fact, some of the most difficult and controversial questions, and then trying to work out some, if not answers, at least better questions about it. So there's a section on critical thinking about politics, critical thinking about religion, critical thinking about mass media, three important things. The polit in the politics section, for instance, I ask a simple question that most of the culture wants to avoid. Are capitalism and democracy compatible? Seems like an interesting question. Certainly not a question that's hard to understand as we look around and see the way that concentrated wealth can distort the political system, but if you sort of frame the question in its most basic form, it's a particularly disturbing question. Whatever you think about capitalism, and you may be getting a hint that I'm not a huge fan of the system, it is a wealth concentrating system. It always has been and always will be. Capitalism concentrates wealth. There's no historical counter to that. The extreme nature of wealth inequality today is part of that ebb and flow. Over time, wealth inequality rises and falls. But throughout its history, capitalism has been a wealth concentrating system. <clears throat> Democracy, as we know, again, whatever you think about it, is based on the idea that we distribute power equally, that all people come into the political process equally. Well, if you're a university professor, perhaps you can pretend that economics happens over here and politics happens here, because they're different departments after all, and if they're in different departments, they can't be related because, okay. So we compartmentalize the study of these things right, as if they're somehow not related. But again, I know of no historical example where the concentration of wealth doesn't affect the distribution of power. You concentrate wealth and you are going to concentrate power. And the degree of that wealth concentration is going to then undermine the degree to which political power is in fact distributed. The way I explain this to students is I say, all right, let's take me and Bill Gates. Bill Gates is worth, uh, what, $53 million or billion dollars? Billion dollars, excuse me. <laughs> Whatever it is. It gets some... I'm worth considerably less than that. <laughs> All right. And I say, to, I say to students, when Bill Gates goes in the voting booth, how many votes does he get? One. When I go in the voting booth, I get one vote. If Bill Gates wants to stand up on the street corner and speak freely, he's allowed to do so under current interpretations of the First Amendment, so am I. If Bill Gates wants to start a political party, he has the freedom of association to do that. If Bill Gates wants to petition the government, both he and I have the same rights. So therefore, Bill Gates and I have the, an equal ability to affect the political process, at which point students laugh and we all understand the obvious, right? which is capitalism and democracy are fundamentally incompatible. Okay. Now, what are we going to do about that? Well, that's an interesting question, and it's a central question of both the Republican and the Democratic Party. That was my big laugh line. It's not. That's, <laughs> see, it's not part of the discussion. So the most obvious fact, ha, 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 see? When I pause, by the way, if there's any, any future concern or confusion, when I pause, that's when you laugh, okay? <laughs> Subtle pause, got it. All right. I forgot that you are not my students, therefore you do not have to try and pretend to think I'm funny, attractive, and smart to get a grade. So this is an occupational hazard for professors. You're constantly speaking to an audience that's reflecting back to you a very distorted image of yourself. All right. Nobody's talking about that except on the margins, yet how can that not be part of the central political discussion of society. Well, it seems to me there's a whole lot of critical thinking. I'm not saying that in the book I resolve the question and provide a framework for a more meaningful democratic society, but that process can't go forward if one doesn't recognize the nature of the problem. And we know a whole lot more critical thinking about that problem. Uh, in the section on religion, I take on the question of whether or not religious fundamentalism, as we typically understand that, is consistent with other aspects of contemporary society, including the modern university, that the tenets of religious fundamentalism, right, an assertion of an unchallengeable set of truths, 
is inconsistent with the basics of a university, which is that there are no settled truths, that all evidence has to be transparent and put forward. I mean, you've got some problems when you have a, a section of the culture that is committed to a religious fundamentalist position and then moving into institutions like the modern university that are premised on an entirely different set of assertions. It's not about whether you believe in God or not, it's whether you believe in a certain way of going forward intellectually. That is one that we don't talk much about, again, because it's rather disturbing, and it inevitably leads to conflicts of varying kind. With the media, um, I talk about the, the, the one thing you can always get people to agree on in this country is that they hate the media. I, I just ask any audience, you know, who here is a big fan of the mass media, especially the news media? Boo, hiss, everybody hates it. In the book, I essentially make the point that hating the media is fine. I used to be a journalist. I teach in a journalism school. I don't mind if people hate the media, but we should hate it for the right reasons. Right? <laughs> and in the section on media, I talk about the limitations of talking about the problems with news coverage and mass media as being only problems of individual bias of journalists. The debates about media often go forward on the assumption that the individual journalists, especially the frontline reporters and editors and photographers, are somehow conveying their biases into the content of the media instead of stepping back and looking at institutional and economic realities. And so that's the kind of critical thinking I suggest we need to do about the media. And then the book ends with some attempts to think about how Critical thinking is not just about a sort of very rigid, rational, logical approach, that we are also these very creative and, in fact, sometimes distinctly non-rational beings. And we know things in a variety of ways. And so I talk about some of the creative ways through paradoxes and aphorisms and other ways that we also open up different kinds of knowledge. Some people would even say there's a way to, to know things through art I'm highly skeptical of that uh, personally, but there are those who, who even say that poetry and such contains knowledge. Uh, oh yeah. uh, but I do think that in addition to you know, critical thinking skills, thinking about how we come to knowledge, figuring out how to take apart questions like democracy, capitalism, religious fundamentalism, the role of media, is there's not only a, a sort of set of technical skills to try to develop that we would teach in the schools, one would hope, uh, and develop as we're adults, but that all of this also depends on restarting a kind of conversation that in, for a lot of people has really atrophied that one of the most consistent concerns, complaints I hear from people is that they have nowhere to go to talk about these kinds of questions. That in too many places, the old adage that if you want to have a successful dinner party or a successful family gathering, make sure nobody talks about religion or politics. That people, that, that, that idea has always been out there and, and from what I can gather, it's being enforced more than ever and that people feel a need to talk about these kinds of things. And so the book is also kind of a plea for talking about religion and politics. And here I don't mean religion merely in the context of you know, doctrinal disputes in particular religious traditions, but really religion writ large, religion and philosophy, those sort of enduring questions that make life interesting. Where did we come from? What does it mean to live a good life? And what the hell happens to us when we die? Those are the questions that animate human societies and have for a long, long time. And those are important. And by politics, I don't mean reducing politics to disputes between Republicans and Democrats and arguing about elections, but this fundamental question about how should power be distributed? Because in any society, there is power. Wherever two or more are gathered, there is some distribution of power, formal or informal. And so when people say, you know, well, just don't talk about religion or politics, my response is, what else is there to talk about? 
what else is interesting? I mean, you know, there's, there's movies and there's sports and there's all sorts of things worth talking about. But in the end, those don't take us very far. That the, the conversations we might remember that might linger on with us typically are conversations about religion or politics. Nobody, I've never heard anyone say to me, God, I, I remember those great bull sessions in college where we talked about, you know, episodes of police story. I don't ever, I've never heard, God, remember we had that great conversation about that episode of police story? Yeah. People remember the conversations in which you made yourself vulnerable and opened up these kinds of questions. And so finding spaces to have those conversations strikes me as incredibly important. And I've, I've been thinking about this the last few days, especially to go back and tie this up and finish up with this notion of anxiety and anguish. And to, again, try to refute the notion that that's a downer. Uh, for whatever reason, it's the last three or four days, I've had conversations every day with a young person, meaning somebody younger than me, typically folks in their 20s or early 30s. And in each case, they came to me either to talk about something related to a class that I'm teaching or for career advice. I'm not sure I'm the person to come to for that. But, but underneath these formal questions about how am I going to pass this test or should I go to grad school or whatever it was, it was clear there was something else lingering. And in each case, I just said, tell me a little bit about what you think about the state of the world and where we're heading. And you could see this change and this sort of sense of acknowledging the grief and being willing. And I said, yeah, it's OK to talk about that here. And we had, in each case, as recently as lunch today, really quite compelling conversations about where each of us saw the world and what the problems were. And that pitch I made about sort of letting go of the anxiety and embracing the anguish, I've actually seen play out now the last three or four days, where each one of these people felt like in their own particular social circles, when they tried to talk about this, they found people shutting them down, walking away, making a joke about it. Right? So good faith attempts to express some of that were shut down. And what I provided uh, was simply a space where that conversation could go forward. And that anxiety didn't give way to, oh, great, everything's fine. Let's go out and skip to the loo. It was about then moving to that other level of really embracing that anguish. And it's from that position, again, that we need not fall into paralysis, I don't think. It's from that position that I really think we can start to make rational judgments about how to spend the limited time, energy, and resources we all have, where we can apply ourselves in the way that is most likely to help not only advance political projects, but create the kind of community and the kind of conversation that I think so many of us are yearning for. About the only thing I can say is that to the degree I've had any success with those big divides, where it appears there is no common ground, on which one can go forward to have a conversation or a debate. My, the, and this might just be a function of age, but the older I get, the more I find it's better to ask questions than to try to argue someone into submission. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, the, one of the other books I've written recently, uh, All My Bones Shake, was about my return to church after fleeing from church. You know, Like a lot of people, I. You know, I've, my, my joke there is that for me, my early religious training was a life-threatening experience because I was almost bored to death by, you know, middle-of-the-road Protestant preachers. A few nods, remember that? Ah, you know. And so I fled from church. It was, you know, a wasteland as far as I could tell. But then I went back to church late in life, in my 40s, when I found a congregation here in Austin, St. Andrew's Presbyterian, with a really progressive theology and and politics. And I found there were a whole bunch of people who actually shared my sort of basic assumptions about religion. And that put me in places where I was with folks who had a much more traditional theology. And they would often look at me funny and say, son, do you really believe in God? You know, 
because at the church I go to, we kind of let go of the notion of a personal God or supernatural conceptions of God. Right? And God becomes a word to use to explore, not to hammer people with. <clears throat> and so some of my brothers and sisters in Christ in the Presbyterian Church don't yet fully accept that I have, in fact, been saved. <laughs> and they will ask me, do you really believe in God? And I always say the same thing back. What do you mean by God? I mean, I'll give you an answer to the question, but first of all, you have to tell me what you mean by the term God, because over time, there have been a whole lot of different ways to understand that. And one of two things happens. Either we have an interesting discussion about what that word evokes for people, or they turn around and walk away because they've never thought about it themselves beyond a kind of cartoon version. And so that's a really productive, I think, strategy. The other thing about climate change, whenever I run into somebody who, who denies that climate science is valid, I always say the same thing, and I hinted at this earlier. I say, okay, what other realm of contemporary science do you not accept the consensus of a peer review process? Right. So by peer review process, we mean the way that contemporary science builds theory by engaging in observation and experimentation according to certain protocols that scientists have developed, submitting that to review by peers, and then slowly building what we call knowledge. Now that system is not perfect, and it's made mistakes before, and we don't want to, again, you know, sort of raise it to the level of some sort of religion. But that peer review science process right, built the world in which we live. And so I say to people, in what other realm of science do you reject the overwhelming consensus of that peer review process? And of course, there's only one other place where that tends to happen, which is in evolution, Darwinian evolution by natural selection. And I say, so in the rejection of evolution, what's fueling that? Is it really a scientific dispute or is it a an ideological dispute that people have with it. And then you can start to, you know, most people live as if science is in fact a reasonably accurate representation of the world we live in. And so if you're going to selectively reject the consensus of peer review science, you have to have some reason for it. And that tends to open up a, a space as well. Again, there are people who are so ideologically committed, again, typically either for theological or economic reasons, to a rejection of that you know, you're not going to win. But at least those questions open up space for people who may be interested in having a conversation. That's the only thing I've found that works. Why would there be a surge in religious fundamentalism that comes along at the same time that modern science sort of speaks to sort of fundamental workings of the universe in some ways? Uh, I don't pretend to be a scholar in that arena, and I don't really think I have much to say beyond what maybe seems obvious, which is that the modern world is a scary place. And I think fundamentalism in general answers our need to make the world a little less scary. But I think if we're going to critique religious fundamentalism, then we also have to critique all the fundamentalisms that currently structure the way people think. And in a previous book, in All My Bones Shake, I talk about the four fundamentalisms, some of which we've covered. Right? Religious fundamentalism is real, and it can do great damage to the world, and I think it should be critiqued. But there's also, especially in a country like the United States, a national fundamentalism, a kind of hyper-patriotic ideology that has its own kind of you know, origin story that has nothing to do with reality about the United States being founded as, you know, the crucible of the modern world and democracy, and we go forward out of a unique benevolence to bring that peace, justice, freedom, and democracy to the world. That was one of those laugh lines, but I'm going to just, I'm going to, I don't want to take any chances with you people. <laughs> You've proven yourself unreliable so far. Right? Well, there's a, you know, the United States is in the grips of an intense national fundamentalism. Why? At the moment when, in fact, all the evidence indicates that the United States has operated like all the great powers have operated, out of a desire to deepen and extend its domination of those segments of the world it can, usually for economic reasons, specifically the economic interests of a relatively narrow elite, that in fact the United States is an imperial project. And just as that is more obvious than ever, right, this tightening of the national fundamentalism goes forward. 
there's, as we said, an economic fundamentalism, a belief that whatever problems are created by markets, markets will magically solve. Right? Like, and of course, the events of 2008 demonstrated the beauty of free markets. Okay, so yet even in the face of that evidence, there's an even tighter grip on this sort of economic fundamentalism. And of course, I think the most threatening fundamentalism in the world today is technological fundamentalism. This irrational belief that we can solve problems that we have created through the same methods. And again, that's not a rejection of research or science to try and deal with things. It's not to say that we cannot do anything. It's to say that if we believe, in fact, that we can continue to draw down the ecological capital of the planet at the rate we have been, well beyond replacement levels, and undermining the integrity of ecosystems, if we believe we can keep doing that indefinitely, patching it up with high energy, high technology, I think that is far more threatening to the world than religious fundamentalism. So fundamentalism needs to be resisted, but I think it has to be resisted across the board. It's not surprising people grab onto it because it provides some sense of certainty and safety in a world that is profoundly unsafe at the moment. Einstein said that if you gave him an hour to deal with a problem, he'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the nature of the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. And there's a lesson in that, too, about this fanatical rush to solutions. Whenever you start talking about fundamental problems, there's always one, of, not from this audience, but from other groups. Well, what are your solutions? We know the problems. Give us your solutions. And my first response is always, no, you don't know the problems. Because if you knew the problems, you wouldn't be asking for a solution. <laughs> because there are problems without solutions. There are problems that if you frame them in with the understanding that you want to continue the existing rate of consumption, for instance, there is no solution to that problem. Right? Seven billion people on this planet consuming at contemporary levels has no solution. So the point is that when one is trying to make the argument that the health of the ecosphere is in dramatic decline, we better do something about it, climate change is not necessarily the best argument to lead with, that there are very, very clear crises. And I always talk about ecological crises in the plural. And I sort of listed them quickly at the beginning, things like just topsoil loss. Right? At the rate we are eroding topsoil, which is where, remember, food grows, for those from the city, um, <laughs> at the current rate of topsoil loss, within a century, there will be literally no topsoil on this continent. Right? I mean, that's not a trivial matter. Uh, really dramatic changes in the hydrological cycle. Just the toxicity everywhere. You said antibiotics. The routine use of antibiotics in commercial feedlots should be enough to scare everyone into dramatic changes. So I think you're right that the case is not only about climate change, that one has to put that in the context of a whole bunch of ecological crises that all have basically the same root, which is, you know, an industrial system, uh, the unintended consequences of which are now profoundly unsustainable. And here, when you say that, people often point to all of the successes we've had because of industrial society. And here, my favorite response comes again from Wes Jackson. Wes is a plant geneticist by training who co-founded something called the Land Institute in the 1970s to do sustained research on sustainable agriculture. How are we gonna take agriculture out of the industrial, petrochemically based contemporary system into something more sustainable? And they're doing really exciting experiments with plant breeding. Uh, I find them exciting, you know, exciting plant breeding experiments. Might, might not <laughs> be everybody's thing, but it's pretty cool stuff. And Wes, getting to the point of making the case for this kind of research, talks about the failures of contemporary agriculture. And the most interesting one is what he calls the failure of success. That if you look at grain yields, for instance, post-World War II, there have been dramatic increases in the yields of the major grains, rice, corn, wheat, soybeans, the, the grains that feed most of the world. 75% of human calories come from those four plants. And there have been dramatic doubling, tripling, quadrupling of yields. Right? And that looks like, on the surface, to be a success, after all. The problem is, as Wes argues, 
is that that success masks a deeper failure, which is there is less soil and the soil that remains is less fertile. And the only thing sustaining that success right now is a chemical infusion into the soil. And that has a limited life. That cannot go on forever. And so, you know, talking about these things in this context of the failure of success, I think, is powerful, and pointing out that there are these multiple crises. Right? Here's another thing I've said to people is I've been lucky to know a lot of very smart people, including some really smart ecologists and environmental scientists. And every time I meet one and get to know them, at some point when I think they won't, you know, leave the room, I say, tell me, I say, you know, I'm a lay person. I don't read original scientific research in most of these areas. I'm not that bright. I said, but things look really bad to me. And I say, how do they look to you? And to a person, every one of them that said, they're far worse than any lay person understands. Yeah. And then my next question is always, then why aren't you saying that in public? And people kind of shrug and don't really have an answer because it's hard to understand how to say that in public. But you know, often these concerns about ecological crises are sort of dismissed by the public as being the hysterical reactions of mostly ideologically driven lunatics like me. And I am maybe an ideologically driven lunatic. But in fact, the, the claims are not hysterical. Right? And the people in these fields are quite aware of all of this. And when you talk to them, um, you get often, you know, in private conversation, very blunt assessments of this. That's a bit far afield from your question, but one more thing about your question. To remember that the effects of climate change are not strictly in the future. We are now living with dramatic effects of, effects of climate change, if not you know, here in such overwhelming ways, although people worry about droughts and storms and all that sort of things. But if you go to other parts of the world, they are not dealing with climate change in the future. They're dealing with it today. There's a very good book, or an unevenly good book, uh, by Christian Parenti, who writes for The Nation a lot. Uh, it's called The Tropic of Chaos. It came out a couple of years ago. And he looks at that band between the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn, which is uh, the kind of the cursed part of the world because it's experiencing direct effects of climate change first. And it's, of course, the place where the legacy of colonialism and imperialism has destroyed societies. And he talks about all the ways that changes in climate are fueling conflicts there. Uh, and it rem it's a reminder that, yes, climate change is to a large degree about the future. It's also about today as well. But I think you're absolutely right that it, it shouldn't be the only or even the first ecological crisis we name when we try to make these arguments. Well, luckily, there has emerged one group which has really produced, I think, the most compelling holistic analysis that really stitches all of this together. And it's conveniently located right here in Austin, Texas, the Third Coast Activist Resource Center, <laughs> which is where any right-thinking person would not only put in all their discretionary income at the moment, but think about planned giving. <laughs> um, no. Uh, I think the, the question is a compelling one. Uh, but I think the answer to the degree there is one, is perhaps unsatisfying. Where should one, if one has some sense that in fact all of these problems are legitimate problems, they're not hysterical rantings of ideological fanatics, then where do you go? Well, it seems to me that you go where your, to some degree, your heart and your head take you together. Nobody is going to be effective in any organizing project if it doesn't sort of come organically out of your own life. And that means some people will put all of their energy into one perhaps very narrow cause. Other people will try to spread their time and energy around. You know, it, th there's no single answer to this. My own answer is that if one recognizes that in fact the, prop the, the task is not necessarily to change things, that things, meaning these systems, are not changeable in the time frame that's meaningful, that rather than thinking about changing things, we might want to start thinking, at least some of us, about how to deal with the change that is inescapable at this point. And so, uh, just to use my own life as an example, for the better part of a decade, I was focused mostly on foreign policy questions, anti-war work, especially after 9-11, and I don't regret having done all of that work, but there was a point at which it seemed like 
expending more energy on those projects that were not getting political traction, that were essentially dead ending, didn't make any sense, but that it did seem to make sense to try and invest in building networks and institutions and actual physical spaces here locally. That in the absence of a clear political project that you can achieve in the short term, like ending a war or changing a government or something, that you always win when you build capacity, when you build networks, especially in a very fragmented and alienated society where you know, people are sometimes just hungry for a place to be that if you create those places or contribute to creating those places, you've done something. And I think that's sort of what guides me. Uh, again, it's not everything one wants to achieve is possible. And sometimes what you want to achieve is impossible. And there's a sort of recognition of that in my own thinking these days. To give you an example, there was in the introduction, she mentioned that I helped produce a film about Abe Osheroff, who none of you should recognize. He's an old radical who died a few years ago. He was one of the last living veterans of the Spanish Civil War and a really inspiring figure I met late in my life and was lucky to call a friend. And I remember at one point in the early 2000s, uh, I was starting to feel like the anti-war movement was going nowhere, that a lot of my time was being wasted, wasted in the sense that it wasn't clearly advancing a project. And I was sort of struggling with this and I was with Abe at his home in Seattle, and I kind of cautiously said this, because Abe was, is a kind of, you know, one of those people you don't want to tangle with. And Abe was <laughs> tough. And Abe had lived through the Great Depression and, you know, the, the, the 1950s when he was hunted by the FBI, and Abe had been through all of it. And I didn't want to sound like a weenie, for lack of a better term. And, <laughs> and I said, Abe, what do you think is possible politically in the next 10 years in this country? And he looked at me and he said, well, nothing, of course. Anybody can see that, nothing. There is no progressive change gonna happen in this country in the next decade, maybe in the next two decades. What are you, stupid? Of course, that's obvious. And I kind of breathed a sigh of relief because I felt like I was somehow becoming pessimistic. He said, no, 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 he said, listen, throughout history, there's all these eras where you weren't gonna achieve anything in the short term. He, was a, he, he had been a, a member of the Communist Party and a real committed leftist, uh, and like many people, he left the party in 1956 when the Soviets invaded Hungary and it was kind of impossible to maintain the fiction that the Communist Party was leading us to the land of milk and honey. But prior to that, he'd been very committed to that. And in the 1950s, you may remember, the Communist Party was not making great inroads in organizing in the United States. And in fact, Abe lived a good part of that decade kind of semi-underground because the FBI was after people like him. Right? And so Abe said, you know, in the 50s, we weren't talking about changing America overnight. It was about commitment to a long-term project. And he said, there are moments in history, which to use the language of the old left, are cadre building moments. They're not mass movement moments. And every time I hear somebody who I have respect for say that, you know, if we just buckle down, put our shoulder to the wheel, shoulder to the grindstone, what do you put to the... Nose to the grindstone, shoulder to the, you put the appropriate body part to the appropriate <laughs> mechanical device and things are gonna turn around magically. Well, that's not always true. And in fact, I often get frustrated with a lot of people on the left side of the fence where I identify politically who kind of, kind of talk that way. Well, I don't think that's productive, number one, because it's not true, it's not likely to happen. And number two, it actually, I think, demoralizes people to raise this idea that if you just keep at it, next year we'll have turned everything around, and next year comes and everything isn't turned around. These are moments to build cadre, to build the connections, the networks, the institutions for that moment when things may change. And that's the great joy of history is it never lets you predict that. Again, I just, I use, in 19, I was born in 1958. <clears throat> if somebody had stood up in 1958 and said, listen, Within a decade, the whole world's gonna be on fire. Every major institution in the world is gonna be under assault. You know, people would've said, are you out of your mind? This country is locked down, it's regressive, nothing's gonna happen. Yet within a decade, in fact, that was true. Every major system in the world was challenged by 1968. Now, you know, it wasn't a magical revolution that you know, solved all problems. 
but there is a contingency to history that one has to always be aware of. The fact that nothing might be possible in the moment and that things suggest that if we want to solve problems by continuing this way of life, nothing is possible ever, doesn't mean nothing is possible at all. And that's a long-winded answer, but that's enough to get me out of bed in the morning. And as I always say, you got to remember, I'm a tenured full professor at a major research institution where I could come to work drunk every day for the next six years and probably keep my job. Although my direct supervisor's in the audience, and I want to point out this is hypothetical only. I don't <laughs> intend to do this. But I mean, I, I have the, the sweetest gig in town, right? And I, so if I wanted to coast, it would be easy. But I don't really ever feel any great desire to do that. The, the, the immediate rewards of that kind of political work are more than sufficient to get me out of bed in the morning without any question. It doesn't mean I don't have days I, you know, that you waver and you wonder. But I think that's, the, in the end, the reward of it. Right? That without knowledge of immediate success, even without knowledge of any success, there are still reasons to go forward. OK, let me take the second question first. And, and this is a good place to end, actually. So, any human system, by definition, can be changed because it's a creation of people and therefore people can change it. And I agree with that. It's also true that there are systems, there might be too much water that's gone through the turbines to change things. Right? That there is also a logic and a force and a trajectory to systems that you can't turn on a dime. Right? And my own best assessment is that, in fact, a lot of the systems that currently structure the world, especially corporate capitalism, have a kind of force, a logic, and a trajectory that we're not going to really turn around in time to, quote unquote, save the world at the level that we might have once thought. That we have to accept, in fact, one of the ways I've said this before, um, I feel like I've been a little too upbeat so far in this talk, so I'm going to kind of <laughs> get a little lay a downer on you. I never like to end on too upbeat a note, but um, I just, one day in class, this is, uh, it might have been your class, Lauren, I'm not sure, but I just, when I grew up, again, I was born in 1958, I was in college in the late 70s, the big moral question was always in terms of population was, what are we going to do with a world of 5 billion, 6 billion, 7 billion, 10 billion? Remember those discussions? I think that that is a compelling moral question. How are you going to feed and provide a minimally decent life for that many people. I think actually the compelling moral question around population that my son's generation is going to face is how do you deal with a massive human die-off? It's one thing to deal with an ever-increasing human population. There's kind of a heroic narrative about we just have to produce more food and be more efficient. You know, people respond to that moral question with a kind of heroic human narrative. What if, in fact, the systems that are in play are not going to be reversed in any meaningful time frame, and that what is in our future is not a world of 10, 12 billion, but a world of 5 billion, 4 billion, 3 billion? That is a profound moral challenge. How do you sit in, let's say, the first world here, knowing that consequences of policies that originated in that first world are, in fact, leading to a massive human die-off? that was, in fact, preventable. That's actually what's on my mind these days. How do you actually cope with that? I don't think any contemporary philosophical or religious system has a way to cope with that. Right. So those are also things to be concerned about. But you're right in some sense that no system created by humans is beyond human intervention, obviously. And that's the impetus to continue, even in the face of very slim odds. On the question of language, uh, I think you're right that you know the people who define the conversation tend to win. <laughs> and the people who define the terms in the conversation especially tend to win. And that's in part also why I've gone back to religion so much, is because take the critique of capitalism. At one point in the history of critics of critiques of capitalism, the language very, was very you know, Marxist or anarchist. All of which I think was intellectually compelling, but in the contemporary moment is going to not be 
terribly useful in mainstream America. I do lots of talks where I critique capitalism, and I have never once used the phrase the proletariat, as far as I know. Or <laughs> You don't need that terminology. I'm not saying that the ideas that animate Marx and those traditions is not useful. But that language, I think we have to let go of. Right? And strangely, I think some of the most compelling critiques come out of the religious traditions, right? which have their own language, right? their own prophetic tradition that is also very useful. And, and of course, all scripture is interpretation, and you can play it any way you like. But I found that those are really, really compelling arguments to make. So to give you an example, I, had, I was speaking to a, a young person who identified as both a right-wing Republican committed to free market capitalism and a committed Christian. And so I just said, I said, I've been you know, trying to pay attention to the New Testament a lot. And it seems to me there are two major figures in the New Testament, Paul and Jesus. And it seems to me the general thrust, like any complex text, it's open to interpretation and sometimes internally contradictory and pretty much a mess. But there seem to be some general things that you can pull out of it. And if you look at Paul and Jesus, it strikes me that both of them were fundamentally committed to a communal sense of identity, an egalitarian distribution of wealth, and a sense of all people's fate being tied together. And I said, does that seem like a reasonable reading to you? And she said, yes. And I said, the moral underpinnings of capitalism construct us as autonomous individuals who should, in fact, pursue self-interest. And in fact, that's the definition of rationality, is to pursue your self-interest. And I said, how do you square the two systems? I don't get it. And she said, well, Christianity is kind of an ideal. And I said, but wait, you just told me that this was the foundation of your, your life. Do you take things to be the foundation of your life and dismiss them when they're inconvenient because they cause you trouble? And the, the great part of that was she was young enough to have not yet developed a, a sort of glib answer to allow her to walk away from the conversation. Right? So it wasn't, you know, the language I used there was language that spoke to her that I think could, and I don't think I was twisting the words. I don't think it was a manipulative question I asked her. I think it was an honest question and a question that everyone who holds those two, what I think are profoundly contradictory positions, should take up. So language is tricky. I, I think we need to invent words and push new kinds of terminology when we can and draw on the best of our traditions as well. And somewhere in that odd mix, we can find some kind of language to make sense of all of this, I think. So with that, I'm going to again thank book people for having such an amazing store that has gone forward. And thank all of you. I appreciate it.